Okay, so let's get started. So welcome everybody to our next session on the book, The Handmaid's Tale, and continuing with, uh, with Mark Schenker on our literary utopia tour. And uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Mark. We've got a lot to talk about. And just remember that next week and the week after, these sessions are going to be on Tuesday, not on Thursday. So next Tuesday, October 3, and then Tuesday, October 10, will be the next two sessions. And with that, and then we'll revert to Thursday for the final session in November. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Michael. Uh, when I designed this series to go from uh, utopia in the 16th century, the book Utopia, into the 21st century, I realized that one of the challenges would be that I couldn't get female authors for the first century because they weren't writing uh, this kind of work. And so I was eager to make sure that for the four, uh, beginning tonight, this is the middle, the fourth of seven, that for the four that are sort of 20th century, 21st century, with an exception for King Lear, that at least two of them would be by women. And this was an easy choice because The Handmaid's Tale is probably the best known and commercially most successful of Margaret Atwood's many novels. She is a very prolific writer. Um, she's written 18 books of poetry, 18 novels, 11 books of nonfiction, eight collections of short stories. She's a very good short story writer, eight children's books, um, and uh, two graphic novels in addition to other pieces and reviews. Uh, I think it will not be long before she's considered for the Nobel Prize. I think she's certainly one of uh, the best writers writing in English over a long, a wide range of things. So um, we have her and then the author uh, also of Cloud Cuckoo Land, our last book. So uh, tonight we're in the 20th century, a book I hope many of you know, have read, um, <clears throat> and not just seen the excellent series, but maybe both. We take a little detour to King Lear that will have relevance, as you will see, to um, Station Eleven, but also to the question of what is it about human nature that seems to thwart the attempts for uh, utopias. Uh, Station Eleven and Cloud Cuckoo Land bring us, as I said, into the 21st century. They're good books on their own uh, merit. So I told David when we were chatting beforehand that I hope the fact that you now have some examples of utopias and utopia, dystopias under your belt uh, these past few weeks, in addition to what you know from your own reading, and that because I hope that this is a book, um, a Handmaid's Tale, that you know outside the context of the series, I'm going to hope that this will be a discussion. There's some 50 of you I think I saw. So uh, rather than putting questions to me to answer uh, as a lecturer, I'm wondering if we could say something, and I'll ask you to speak, but not at great length in deference to whether there are other people waiting to talk. Um, looking at this novel, especially if you knew it or read it before, in the context of this series, do you see it any differently from when you read it maybe uh, 20 years ago or more? or um, when you read it for the first time, if it was recently, how do you see it informed by the things we've talked about, the things we've read? So folks, you know the drill. I got the Q&A box open and feel free to type away, comment, et cetera, quest, uh, question, I'll say, comment. I'll, I'll say as we're just waiting for um, you to join us in question, that clearly these things that are being recorded in the book, reported in the book, are things that were happening in our world in the 1980s and earlier. Genital mutilation, um, totalitarian religious regimes, um, communities in America uh, that have very conservative religious communities uh, and that are militant about it, um, the issue of the control of women's reproductive rights. Margaret Atwood was very careful and strenuously asserted that this is not a science fiction book. All these things have happened, and this kind of society is actually possible, which is why she wrote the novel. 
some 50 years ago. Anyone, Michael? Nope, still waiting. I should have said some 40 years ago. Um, so I'll say a few things. Uh, one is that uh, some of the works that we've looked at have been works where people are talking about in the novel, in the in the work, like Utopia. Uh, might this be the kind of society? Um, it, it, there's the guise of a visitor coming to report, but more is writing in the spirit of what might we do to create an ideal state. Um, when we get to um, Gulliver's Travels, he's reporting on a state or states that are clearly satirical, and he's implying uh, that there is no such thing as the best of all possible worlds, and that uh, excessive love of reason is itself unreasonable. Erewhon was also uh, satirical, uh, and so not, none of those works suggest that there was a plan in America, in our time, our, our fictional time, when this uh, apocalyptic dystopian society was created, that people in America, in New England, uh, made a um, ideal state, ideal for some. So that's radically different. That, that's very different that uh, this construction she said it in new england because she was working on the notion of puritan communities which despite the history book suggest suggesting uh that they left religious intoler intolerance um in europe and england in order to themselves be more tolerant in fact they created very very um exclusive communities um even when uh, they decided, the Congregationalists decided that the spirit of religious community was any group of people who get together and want to be a religious community can make up their own rules. They don't need a pope. They don't need a presbyter. They don't need governance. Uh, and when some people came along and said, um, is it possible uh, that the number of people in the community community could be one? Anne Hutchinson said, how, how about a congregation of one? Um, Emily Dickinson liked that idea some generations later. They said, no, that, that's no good. You, you can't have a church of one. And basically they excluded her. Uh, and uh, that created what come to be called the antinomian crisis. Nominate, no, nome is governance. Autonomy is your self-governance. Uh, and the idea that you could not have a movement in which there wasn't any governance. In the Congregationalist model, the governance is the community. But if you're only person in it, they, are, they argued, there is no governance because that's just independence. And as we all know, uh, American history has a very complicated relationship with the idea of independence. Well, I don't know, Mark. You might need to uh, you might need to be a little more uh, provocative as we go along. So let me let me ask you, Michael. Do you have a way that you can have people respond in chat, voting that if I ask a question, we can know how many people attending say yes or no? Um, I'm not sure. I I think there's a way to do it, but I'm not sure how to okay. do it. I'd be curious if the silence is that people didn't have a chance to read it or reread it, which I uh, I respect. Uh, I've been there. Um, or whether it's just that people are uh, cogitating uh, what they want to say about the book. I, wa I want to say again, and I hope I'm not wrong about this, if you've read the book, there's a lot in it to think and talk about, either in the context of a series on utopia or more generally. Um, I'll vamp a little bit longer, Michael, and again, I'm prepared, but I'd rather not lecture for an hour about a book that I think has relevance to people's reading and lives. So um, the idea that um, uh, these handmaids have this prefix that they're of Fred or of Glenn uh, is a kind of perversion of women taking their husband's surnames, which used to be universal and is still common but not universal. 
Um, and the idea that of rather than just taking your husband's name has a real sense of possession that uh, property this belongs to this is of so and so and since these women are being trained uh, to be baby makers uh, of of course means derived from so my grandson is of my daughter uh, and to say that a woman the woman who narrates is um, a Fred, which looks like off red, of course, is to suggest that there's a, not just a possessiveness, but something uh, that purports to be natural or biological. And part of the issue is that this society, because of uh, pollution and uh, uh, ecological disaster, uh, no longer has a sufficient number of fertile women. So there is a um, a crisis that the society is trying to address. Uh, that is partly the problem. That is, it's it's not. It wasn't just that meteors struck the earth and killed the dinosaurs. The way this society lived before it begins causes them to have to make what they think is a radical uh, self preservation plan, plan, and it doesn't come out very well for the women. Uh, it turns out that a number of important people, including her commander, break the rules, uh, break the rules in sexual ways, break the rules in trivial ways about playing Scrabble or shooting the breeze. And the suggestion is, once again, that human nature cannot be governed by uh, issues of perfection that run counter to what it is to be human. I mentioned in the very first session uh, about the issue of if utopias are so grand, why do they have to be uh, designed and compelled upon people? And Michael and I have been talking about doing possibly a Tennyson series next spring. And in The Lotus Eaters, which is one of his poems about um, uh, Ulysses, uh, the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey in his poem uh, decide that they shouldn't go home. They love being drugged uh, because if they go home, they will trouble joy. They'll they'll come uh, and their families and friends and children will have been used to their absence and they'll be unsettling. And they decide that they're going to swear an oath. Ulysses is not part of this conversation. Uh, they're going to swear an oath uh, that they won't return. And I raise the question then, uh, I'm not, I don't expect you to remember, but I raise it when I teach it is, if this is such a good place to be, why do you have to have your fellow mariners swear an oath? And that there's this strange tension between, it's not everyone who thinks this is the best place. The people in charge think it's the best place. And the other people are forced to either agree or live in compulsion. Uh, and of course, you could argue that no utopia can exist if many people, you could say any people in the population, are forced, compelled to participate. So, Mark, uh, two, yeah. two, point, two points to, uh, to make or point in a question. One is uh, you're a little bit of a victim of your own success because someone has actually written Speaking just for myself, I attend these because I do want to hear Dr. Schenker expound for an hour. No problem for me if there are no questions. Okay. Well, but I want to say I want to I want to say I appreciate that. Although I want to say uh, I do think that if one of seven uh, presentations is largely readers, that's not a bad thing. Secondly, my entire academic career in and outside of formal educational institution is based on the idea that you read a text in a context of a community of readers, that, that you get to hear from other people uh, what they think about this. I'm also aware that this is the first time in this series we're doing a woman author. Uh, I assume from past experience that most, if not, that many, if not most of the people attending tonight are women, uh, and that this book is not so old that it doesn't have relevance in 2023 in American elections and other kinds of initiatives that happen even outside of elections that affect women. 
So uh, I, I'm going to say that I appreciate the vote of confidence, but I think this book is different. Did you say there was a second comment, Michael? I've actually got two. So let me just uh, let me just ask the question. You can think about the answer for a minute, and then I'll and then I'll read you a, a comment that came after that. So the Thank first one, first one was Patricia saying, "I have lots to say about the story, but I'm a bit stumped by the specific question you asked." So if you want to. Okay. Think about that for a minute and I can give you another comment from Elizabeth who says, this was my first time reading this book. I must say that I think I am somewhat stunned at how visible the risks of such a reality are all too visible right now. I think it would have been easier to digest it at an earlier time, 10, 20 or 30 years ago, when the risks, at least in this country, seem to be remote or even absurd. Sadly, I did not have to use my imagination. Yeah, so um, so it was written nearly 40 years ago, but we none of us can read everything. Um, I'm gonna translate my question and then replace it with a better question. So the original question was, uh, if you've read the novel and if you've been attending the series, how does what we've talked about, whether it's particular books and authors or the general sense of the series so far, we're at the halfway point, how does that change or affect your reading of Handmaid's Tale? But I'm gonna replace that with, was it Elizabeth who asked that question? Uh, it was Patricia who asked that question. Elizabeth Patricia. had the Elizabeth had the comment. Okay, so thank you both, Patricia. What do you want to say? Uh, what would you most like to say about uh, a Handmaid's Tale? What What's most striking to you? And maybe that will engender a conversation. So we'll give her a chance to uh, to react to that if she uh, if she wants to. And we have another comment from Catherine that says this book was painful to read when it was published, and it seems more painful now. The casual disregard of women as people maps directly to our current crisis over the right to control our own bodies and our health. It is not quote unquote nowhere. It is here. Yeah. So while we wait. Uh, you know, I show up not just to talk about themes, but of course to talk about literary analysis. So let me say a few things. One is, uh, it's a handmaid's tale. She tells her own story. And traditionally in literature, until the 20th century, women did not typically tell their stories. When uh, uh, Jane Eyre was published, uh, and it turned out it was a coming of age story by a woman from her adolescence, to have a woman tell a coming of age story about herself was striking for more than one reason. Coming of age stories were for decades and centuries and still are largely about men. It's what they called a male plot. And that she would have a coming of age story, one, was striking in the middle of the 19th century, and two, that she was telling it. So one thing we should recognize here is this story is getting out because it's coming from off red. That's, that's a, an act of defiance. Another thing is that the, na- this, the idea of a tale, um, a tale has two connotations in literature. The negative one is that it may be made up, tall tales, oh, that's a t- tales of the Old West. But the other more positive one is it reminds us that a tale has a teller that a tale has a teller, and the tale reflects, reveals the teller. And so one thing about this book is, even though it has an indeterminate ending, part of that, I think, is to give the uneasiness of where is this problem that's not just in Gilead, but in our globe, uh, on our globe, in our country, where's it going? Part of it, I think, is to add to that sense of it can't be determined. And part of it is to let the reader decide, are you more likely to think she got out or that she was deceptively recaptured? recaptured? Uh, I do think it's to her credit, that is, Atwood, that she creates a hero who tells her own story. And even if she is recaptured, even if she's killed, she has gotten this story out. And that gives her a reality 
that gives her an authority. It's not an accident that the word author and the word authority come from the same root. Uh, if you're an authority on a subject, you have expounded and written on it, and she gets to tell her own tale, which on this globe, many women in many countries, including ours, don't get a chance to tell their own story. So uh, one one very short, quick comment, and then another one following that. So Kelly's Kelly basically said, I wasn't able to get through it, so I'm eager to hear, but I don't have many answers. And then the comment that followed that was Gulliver's Travels. This is from Celia. Gulliver's Travels, Irwan, and Handmaid's Tale all make one question basic cultural assumptions. The Handmaid's Tale is the most blunt of the three. Yeah, and, and can I, if that person would mull over this question, and I'll keep talking while we're waiting, and of course you can decline to answer. Um, in what way, what cultural assumptions are being challenged by Handmaid's Tale? I, I, I think that's right, but I'd be curious to know uh, what your take is on that. I do think this is a deeply disturbing book, not just because disturbing things happen in it, not just because we experience, as we do with all first-person narrators, an intimacy with the hero uh, because she's telling her own tale. That's true in most first-person narrations. First-person narration is a kind of literary version that to uh, know someone through first-person narration is to be inclined to be sympathetic or empathetic or even identify with them. I think that's true. I will also say that I have said to this group um, in the library and in the Zoom room uh, that I think you could teach a respectable course of literary analysis by focusing on just three themes, uh, secrets, ghosts, and doubles. Uh, clearly, in a novel in which the handmaids are somewhat interchangeable, um, they, they aren't individuated for the society, the commanders, the wives of the commanders. There are lots of doublings. Uh, secrets, of course, is part of, of a society. If you're oppressed and you want to resist, that resistance is almost always going to be secretive. And it's the secrecy of the resistance that raises the question, is she being helped or um, are, they, are they friends or enemies of people who seem to be hate helping her? But I also want to say something about uh, ghosts. Uh, early on, there's a reference to a place uh, on a ceiling where there was a a chandelier and it's now gone and capped over and uh when i say ghosts in my analysis of literature i'm including actual spirits whether real or imagined dead people return to life but i'm also including anything that can be called in my phrasing the presence of an absence so i recently did um uh so long see you tomorrow uh and if you were to look at a college yearbook and among the many smiling faces on the page, there was a blank space. Sometimes they put an icon in it saying absent or, you know, no, no photo. And uh, when there's a no photo of someone you went to school with, and sometimes they'll put a picture of, you know, where's Waldo? That photo, that space, that gap, that Waldo is the presence of an absence. Uh, if there was no space on the page, you might forget that Michael Bellicosa didn't show up for his yearbook photo. But having a space for him and his not being in it is the pictorial uh, equation equivalent of no comment. What does it mean when someone says no comment? They're saying I have nothing to say and they're saying it in brackets. I am affirming that I have nothing to say. Uh, this novel is loaded with instances where you are reminded of what was, that the presence of what you had before uh, is reminded, you're reminded of by its absence. Uh, I hope I'm clear in that feeling. I've given this example before. I had a godmother named Aunt May. Um, if she were still alive, she'd be here. If she were dead, as she is, and I never gave her a thought, she'd be gone. But since she is gone, but I think of her quite often, especially now that I'm a grandparent, I am reminded constantly 
of the absence of Aunt May. I'm not grieving and I'm not crippled. I'm not traumatized. She was a dear person and she's gone. Uh, literature is fascinated by how human beings and whole societies negotiate the presence of an absence, a reminder of deprivation or loss or emptiness. And this novel is painful partly because the people in the novel remember what was. And those of you who commented, so far I think only women, have some have mentioned that it's hard or painful to read, I think because of that, because uh, it, it calls our attention to what has been removed, to what they've been deprived of. Having um, sex, having babies, carrying babies, um, being a mother, these are among the most fundamental things that a society can experience. And not just the women, but the other members of the family, male and female, who have something vested in the children. This is radically different from the more uh, bloodless conversations in the other novels we read so far about how society should work. Th this is a much starker book. Yeah. So Irene has said that the government can alter the status of a citizen or even a class of citizens is most terrifying. How long can such a system persist? Yeah. And uh, who is that who said that? Irene. Irene, thank you. And Irene raises the question, which is, can any utopia be um, created by some kind of administrative body, no matter how well thinking? Can any collective get together and no matter how well intentioned, no matter how clever, can they create something that could be uniformly applied to a society, even if the society is just the Republic of Gilead, just some uh, who knows how, how much land that covers. But you don't get to, like Anne Hutchinson, you don't get to uh, say, I want to have my own rules. Um, and since utopias don't naturally ar arise, otherwise we'd have no series, um, if utopia developed just in the natural evolution of the way people are, you wouldn't have to dream or make them write about that. At the center of the series is that individuals long for perfection, and there's no example of it on the planet. Even the first myth of Christianity was paradise that becomes Eden. Paradise is a positive thing. The word Eden in most people's minds is the fall. And even if it's a fortunate fall, if you believe in the, the story of Christ's redemption, um, it was not. Uh, a place you could stay. They were cast out. So um, the question becomes, is it possible to have a collective utopia if part of the cost is you have to be a member whether you like it or not? And obviously the book is loaded with sexism, uh, male dominance, white supremacy, uh, and a bullying by uh, extremist uh, religious groups. Um, I was talking in a class years ago, many years ago, and talking about a religious fundamentalism. And I saw that a couple of the women in, in class sort of screwed up their faces in distaste. And I said, you know, um, it, it is easy for us to think of fundamentalism in the sense of terrorists, whether homegrown or um, international, uh, and that part of fundamentalism is that you believe that the original version of something, your belief, the way the world works, how communities operate together, you believe that the original, the fundamental version is better than the current version. Uh, that's, that's one of the requirements of being a fundamentalist. But the other one is, uh, that you think it's such a good idea, you'd like other people to participate. But the third idea, which is not required, is you're going to require them, you're going to be militant about having people join. And because terrorists who have radical ideas, and I want you not just to think of Iranians or Afghanis, I want you to think of 
homegrown terrorists just for the sake of fairness and equity. Uh, we do have examples in America, and I'm sure there are examples in other countries that I'm unaware of, of fundamentalists who want to live that life, would be happy to welcome outsiders into it, but are not going to beat the crap out of you if you won't join. And that's the Amish and the Mennonites. And although they're not adverse to outsiders uh, coming and joining their communities, they know from experience, and I have some secondhand experience with this, that many people who come, come as tourists. They're amused or entertained by the quaintness of this life. And Lancaster County and other places have made a lot of money about tourist trade. There's nothing wrong with that. But they are deeply suspicious of whether people actually want to join. But they have never been uh, militant, um, physical or violent in getting people to join. But there's so many examples of militant fundamentalism that I'm sorry to say that many people, and not just my undergraduate students, think that fundamentalism requires you to be militant. It doesn't. But the implication in all these books is that no version of utopia is so attractive that people are going to buy it without some kind of coercion. Yeah, and actually thinking about a comment I think you made the last time, another way of thinking about why utopias don't just automatically come into being is sort of similar to why a whole bunch of broken pieces of, of pottery on the floor don't spontaneously turn into a tea mug on the table. Right. And I'll, I'll also quote myself from last time or the time before. Utopias arise from a wish for something that originates in the part of us that can't have utopias. We, we, we want it because we can't have it. It, 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 it doesn't exist. Um, if human beings were naturally inclined individually or as a collective to improve their circumstances and there wasn't desire, temptation, anarchy, confusion, um, will to power, all the things that muck things up, uh, it would have happened by now. But it becomes, utopia becomes a true no place because it exists in a kind of imagination. And it is interesting that so many of the books about utopia, wait, I have a little factoid here. Um, Uh, I can't put my foot on it. Uh, I'll find it eventually. But um, how many hundreds uh, of utopias were written about before 1900 uh, and how many since? I'll, I'll, I'll find it among my papers here. Um, so the catch-22 is it becomes so desirable exactly out of the thing that's dissatisfied in individuals or communities that make it impossible. Again, Eve and Adam were told, you can have anything you want. This is a big, beautiful place. Anything you want. You just can't have, let's see, the fruit of that tree. And people like Milton, who wrote religious commentary on Genesis, and of course he wrote Paradise Lost, said that the myth, or the, the Bible story, if you believe it, is meant to say there is no uh, freedom without some kind of limit, and that the God of the Old Testament gave Adam and Eve everything except this one thing to make them understand discipline, to make them understand um, obedience. Uh, and that, of course, what we find out is Eve is in love with that apple. Maybe, maybe a, a serpent helped her make that choice, but it turns out the thing you can't have is pretty attractive. When Tipper Gore had the brilliant, stupid idea that we should label albums that have questionable lyrics, what did kids do? They went in and they looked for the label. Uh, she helped She helped uh, save them con shopping time. She didn't intend that, but that's what the kids wanted. What's the thing I can't have? Let me have two copies. I'll give one to my brother. So uh, here, here's a, a literary question or comment that Susan basically has said, 
Are we seeing reverberations of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales? Is that the end of the comment? Yeah. Yeah. I do think uh, she very much intends that we think of uh, the tales of the Canterbury Tales, a masterpiece, uh, because the suggestion there is in Canterbury Tales that the story being told is both a story uh, that you could read anywhere, but because they're the partner's tale, the Reeves tale, and so on, they are an extension of not just a person, but a type. And to Charles's credit, although he was a medievalist who, like Dante, believed in types, types of spirits, types of people, um, he didn't have access to modern psychology. There's nothing typical about these stories. Yes, they may reflect the nun's priest. They may reflect what a reeve does. A reeve, by the way, I think people find this interesting, is a minor official, um, like a justice of the peace. And if they're the reeve of the shire, they became known as the shire reeve, which is where we got the word sheriff from. And the original sheriffs were shire reeves, closer to notary publics, than to police officers, but that, that was the beginning of uh, something like a police force. Um, I do think uh, Margaret Atwood, a brilliant woman, intended a connection to Canterbury Tales to suggest that this telling is also affected, shaped by Offred, that she is both an example of a handmaid and she is herself. And Janet has made the comment again, we have the hunger for wanting instead of having in this nightmare, The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, and of course, wanting is very heady. Uh, wanting is, um, let me use the right word, exciting. Um, Emily Dickinson created a whole poetic philosophy out of the idea that wanting may be more satisfying than having. Uh, Marcel Proust's narrator uh, in Remembrance of Things Past finds that his memory of that childhood Madeleine is much better uh, than the actual, uh, I'll call it pastry rather than cookie that he experiences years later. And I teach in my poetry classes a, a poem by Sylvia Plath, one of the poems that's not autobiographical and suicidal and dark, which is a lot of her work, very good poetry, but hard to read. She has an excellent poem called uh, Poems Potatoes. And in it, I'm going to translate significantly, but I recommend the poem to you. She says that when you try to write a poem, uh, I, I am dumbing this down, not because of you, but because I, I can't do justice of, to it without your having read it. So here's a quickie version. If you wanted to write a poem about a potato, you can never capture the essence of the potato because the potato exists in its knobby brownness as an actual thing. And that when you try to write a poem about it, of the many versions of it that you could write, or oh, if you try to paint a picture of it, she gives that example too, once you commit to the poem, all the other infinite alternatives of the poem or painting you might have made are cast out. Uh, you are bound in a negative way by the poem you committed to. And of course, the potato exists without any help from you. The potato is going to go about its brown, knobby way. But you want to make a recreation of it, visually or poetically. And it turns out that for you to do that, you have to choose one way and not do the countless other possibilities. And she she implies that that's why art is so difficult. You, you can see the writer with the cliche of the crumpled up pieces of paper on her desk and around the wastebasket in the corner of her, her den. Um, I do think that wanting can never be taken away from you. You can always want. So Kelly's follow-up comment, uh, it says, from Mark's sublime to my ridiculous, I was struck, <laughs> by the, 
I was struck by the description of the commander's wife. Didn't everyone think of Tammy Faye? Certainly the author would have been familiar with her, but why is she here? Thwarted principles? I don't get the last question. Uh, she, yeah. She's there in the 80s, there were such people. And uh, Serena Joy is both a caricature and a quite spot on a kind of person that existed uh, in the 1980s. They're still around. I don't think they're as dominant. Um, remember that Reagan was president also in the 1980s, and there was a great conservative movement. And remember, those people didn't just want to spread the word. They wanted your money. And uh, I am a, uh, I'm not proselytizing, I'm a religious Christian, but I recognize there are lots of problems with Christianity, just as I think of myself as a patriotic American, lots of problems with America. Um, but it sickens me that I know that countless people have given money they couldn't afford to people who are largely charlatans. And I'm not sure the comfort they got from giving that money uh, is worth the money they gave. Now, maybe they could afford it and maybe it does make them feel better. But there were such women uh, who were counterparts to the men because they're selling marriage. They're selling middle class conservative life, the family unit. And uh, there are single male preachers, uh, but the uh, whatever Jim Baker and Tammy Faye's operation was called, it was built on the notion that they were a couple, a loving couple. And if you, if you uh, encounter Tammy Faye, uh, in a novel or a movie, and I know there have been movies made about her, 50 years before she existed, you'd say, this is a caricature. Th th this is ridiculous. Th this could never happen. Well, it happened. Like Titanic and the World Trade Center and the Holocaust and other things I've referenced as uh, the unreality of reality. Let me say, Michael, I haven't heard a male name yet, unless Kelly is a male. No. Nope. Um, are there no men in the group who have something to say? Well, you you've thrown that out there. Let's let's see. I know. Is it know. only the women who think I'm sublime? Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the audience. You can see them in the uh, in the participant list. But for the moment, there's no there are no open questions at the moment. Okay, I'm not putting anyone on the spot at all. Uh, I, I would never call, if you were a student in my class and I could see you, I would never call on you, uh, ambush you. So I want to go back to this notion that it may be hardwired into the desire for utopia, that it's, it's very impossibility makes people try to figure it out and also explains why there are so many more examples of dystopian fiction than fiction that actually tries to be uh, utopian in some way. And we come back to what was true in Gulliver's Travels and explicit at the end of uh, Utopia, which is, is it possible that the true utopia is a community of kind people, of generosity, of charity, of having no prescription or program, no oath you have to swear, no sign on the dotted line, that to be considerate and thoughtful of others, it sounds, uh, as my children would say, cheesy, but I think that's what a lot of literature comes down to. I'll say, say something more. Um, if you believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, pretty good rule. It doesn't work if uh, I think that Michael will not mind my making fun of him. Uh, every time we meet or talk, because I myself don't mind being made fun of. I have a very thick skin and I wouldn't mind people mocking me. And so I assume that if I am going to do unto others, Michael, as he could do unto me, that my thick skin means that I have the right to mock him. But of course the unwritten codicil within the golden rule that makes it work is do unto others as you would have others do unto you if you were them. 
So it's not just about action. It's my having to know Michael well enough to know he's actually not happy and quite sensitive about people mocking him. And I now know him well enough not to do it. So the rule is not just the not doing, it's knowing him well enough to know that he wouldn't like it. That's empathy, that's understanding, that's kindness. And most of the work that suggests something positive suggests, like Thomas More, the character in his narrative, I know he's tired. And I know that he would want me to do justice to these theories and uh, reports. Um, but I don't want to get him when he's tired and hungry and upset him because there are a lot of his ideas I don't like. He's being candid with us, more candid with us than he is with Raphael Hitler Day. So I'm going to bide my time. There is so much humanity, kindness, empathy in those three sentences that it overwhelms the entire uh, enterprise of let's create a great society. You want to have a good society? have people who not only treat other people well, but get to know them well enough to know what would good treatment of this person be. There's a lot of wisdom in what I just said, not my wisdom. The golden rule is not about action. It's about knowing somebody well enough to know how you should treat them. Yep. So I've got a comment from uh, from an anonymous attendee. That's just a feature of the way some participants show up in Zoom. Okay. I'm a, I'm a male, and I really appreciate Atwood's perspective. I did a crossword puzzle today where one of the answers was, quote, mansplaining. I've been in situations where that word drew wide-eyed responses from males in the room. The thing is, let's be honest about it. We're still in a male-dominated society. Yes, we are. I, I, I appreciate, especially since you're anonymous, I appreciate your contributing. Uh, I, I hope I didn't push you into it. And let me say we could have a perfectly good discussion with only one gender of several talking. We could have a good discussion if a handful of people, male or female or some other gender, uh, would have dominate the conversation because other people weren't of volunteering. But yes, we, we still live in a male-dominated society. And even if it doesn't seem to be in our practice and our laws, language often takes a long time to catch up. And so um, I don't know the last time you talked about hanging up on someone when you no longer hang up. I don't know the last time someone talked about um, uh, dialing somebody. Uh, I certainly know that generations from now will wonder why whatever conveyance we have is rated in terms of horsepower. Um, but in terms of human interaction, I've made this point. Um, there's a short story uh, called A Manual for Cleaning Women uh, that originally was uh, titled Cleaning Lady, and it was revised either by the ed the author or the editor. Uh, and the author's name will come to me, I hope, um, because it wanted to be more inclusive. And when I teach that excellent short story uh, by somebody, uh, you could look it up, Manual for a Cleaning Woman. Um, I point out to my, my book groups, largely female, but not exclusively, that um, what is the male version of the person who comes into your office building at night to clean up. Uh, if it's a female, she's the cleaning lady or the cleaning woman. It's up to you to decide which of those is a better term. But no man is ever called, oh, the cleaning man was in my office last night. Oh, going out, I said goodnight to the cleaning guy, the cleaning man. We call him a janitor. That is, he gets a title. He gets a title. And the title comes from the Roman god Janus, J-A-N-U-S, who can look both ways, is two-faced, but in a positive sense of not being one person and hiding a secret identity, but looking forward and looking back the way we all should be doing. And uh, January gets its name from Janus because it's the beginning of one year and the end of another. And janitors come from Janus because they clean hallways that go in two directions at once. They go that way and they go the other way. So it turns out that no matter how much you might respect um, equality, embedded in the language is that men who clean 
have titles and women who clean uh, are cleaning ladies. And if you extend that to how long it was that uh, actresses were actresses because there had to be a suffix to say they're different because they're women, or the many way in which women are talked about differently from men in language that can be sexist or at least uh, excluding without people even realizing it. My granddaughter, who's four, has been taught by her mother, her kind-hearted mother, that people shouldn't say about, oh, the witch in Cinderella, that she's evil or wicked. We should say that she's unkind because unkindness is about other people and little people should understand about unkindness and kindness. And she also explains to my four-year-old granddaughter who can't escape we can escape a population of princesses in the Disney universe and the various movies that people watch and that are good movies. But she tries to tell her the key to her princess is not being beautiful and wealthy. It's being kind. And I say this because you realize when you're around little children how much negativity, sometimes by race or class or gender, is in the hidden parts of language. And my four-year-old has become a brown shirt for reporting any indiscretions. So my daughter will not allow people to call somebody an idiot or refer to somebody in conversation. This idiot was in front of me on the street. And you'll hear from the other room, from the four-year-old, we don't use that word. And I bring this up to say, I. I sometimes say about myself, I was so stupid in not remembering, and my granddaughter will tell me not to use that word, even about myself. I say this in the connection of this, that you think of the many words that we have that seem to categorize women separately, even if it's trying to make them more important or special, like motherhood or Madonna or virgin, uh, uh, male virgins, are they male virgins? You wouldn't think so. Uh, a female's virginity is not just something that is a social construct. It's something that many people put a lot of energy into protecting. Honor killings, um, uh, a woman, a family member killed uh, because of an indiscretion uh, that is um, governed by a tribal a bloodthirsty notion. And it doesn't just happen outside of this country's borders. There are honor killings all the time in 2023, all over the world. And why? Because there is this utopian perfection notion of right behavior. And women have to have it enforced because women have the power of engendering desire. Why is it that in so many myths, the power of a woman? is either to be sainted like a Madonna, and of course, the Virgin Mary was a virgin because the myth couldn't let her have sex. And when she died, she didn't die. She was assumed into heaven. I'm not mocking this. She could not be corrupted into a corpse. She could not be violated in giving birth to the Messiah. Uh, so you're a Madonna, or you're a witch, uh, or a whore. And what is a witch? It's someone whose power is invested in her femaleness. Um, many cultures think of Wiccans, witches, as positive figures, like a wizard or a, uh, a mage, a, a, a wise man. Uh, but they got corrupted. Why? Because women uh, cloud the minds of men because of desire. That, that's a lot of what has happened. Uh, this country was built on how to manage desire. Uh, in the many great plays of uh, American playwrights, there are two that have desire in the title, Desire Under the Elm and A Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, it turns out America has a complicated relationship with desire, uh, that wanting may be itself uh, dangerous, even as we said earlier, that wanting is something they can never take away from you. A lot of the origins of this country was controlling desire. Uh, we think of ourselves 
as synonymous with our identity, if we have a religious dimension to us, if we believe we have a soul, many 21st century Americans would think of the soul and the self being intimately connected. But to the Puritans of early America, the self was the enemy because the self was what took you away from the soul and the soul was something different from you. The self was the thing that wanted, that desired. Um, I, I maybe sound like I've gone off topic, but it will lead to the conversation next time. I'm talking about uh, King Lear, and there I'll be happy to talk. I'll be damned if I let any man talk at that session. I'm kidding. Um, I, I'd always take an opportunity to talk about King Lear, but I'm talking about it because Lear raises the issue of in the absence of the great chain of being, in the absence of the feudal system, which wasn't true for Lear, but was true for the author, Shakespeare is living in a, a climate where there's no longer the hegemony of the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire. There's no longer the comfort that the great chain of being says everything is plotted hierarchically, so everything is above something and below something. Now, there can be anarchy. So what is the nature of human nature? What is it that binds people together? Is it family? Is it honor? Is it uh, a kind of symbiosis? I'll do help you because you can help me. Is there something, does it have an economic basis? And in the story, there is a king with three daughters, one of whom is better than the other two, although the idiotic father can't see it, for reasons I'll talk about. So sisters who are radically different from one another. And the subplot, an excellent subplot, most Shakespeare plays have subplots, not all of them, is a duke who has two sons named Edmund and Edgar, much to my student's chagrin. Couldn't one be Billy and one be Tony, but no. And one of them is a bastard son and the other one was born out of the marital wedlock. And they're radically different people. They are good and evil. Don't tell my granddaughter, but they are. And the question that arises in the play and in the minds of some of the characters is, what is it that makes this difference? What is the nature of nature in a century, not Lear's, but Shakespeare's, where there's no longer the old rubric of somebody telling you what to do? So that's why I went on maybe too long about uh, nature and wanting and desire. Um, I'll end there. I see that it's 8.01. Um, uh, next time it will be more of a straightforward lecture. I hope uh, if and when you read the last two novels, Station Eleven and Cloud Cuckoo Land, uh, you'll be prepared to talk more if you want to. I I I'm not judging you. I'm just trying to animate the end of this course by letting people who are reading fiction in our own time uh, contribute uh, conversations about it, if you have that. Great. Thanks, Mark. So there were a few other comments, but I think we got to let them go. But uh, hell of them. As, hell usual, of them. as usual, folks, uh, Mark is very happy to get direct email. So if you want to uh, send, send any kind of a message or comment directly to him, um, I can give you his email address. I'm sure you can find it yourself if you don't know it, but please ask me and I'll shoot his email address right back to you. It's and, not uh, the old email address at Yale. I just want to emphasize that. Right. So if you've, if you've got an email that you've sent to him before with a Yale address, it's not the right one. Just, just send me a note and I'll send his correct uh, email right back to you. Um, otherwise, I think this was a very good, uh, very good discussion. We did get, a decent amount of interaction and uh, looking forward to uh, to next week, actually the next two weeks. Remember, they're sort of connected together, as Mark said. And don't forget, they're on Tuesdays the next two weeks. Yeah. And let me say, and this is not being patronizing, the comments that were made, either as comments or questions, were excellent comments about uh, the novel and about its situation in a world of reality. It, it, it's uh, impossible to ignore reality when you read The Handmaid's Tale, the way you can ignore it when you read uh, the earliest books we read. So thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Michael, very much. Thank you all for coming and attending, and I'll see you next time. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. We'll see you next Tuesday.